Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study once again today. We thank you for the depth of insight and instruction you are giving us in our present study of the Exodus series. Thank you for the past studies. Thank you for touching our lives. Thank you for instructing us in the way of righteousness. Lord, there's something before us today. And we know that this is very rich. We are praying, O oh Lord, that you grant every one of us spiritual appetite. So that we'll be able to take in everything you have for us in this passage for study tonight. In Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding. Help us to understand the scripture. Help us to understand the interpretation of the Spirit of God. And we pray, O oh Lord, that in a very definite, personal, intimate way, you will interpret as well as apply all these words to every one of us in Jesus' name. Glorify yourself. Exalt your holy name. Help us to see you in clearer light so that we'll have more confidence and trust and faith in you, the Almighty One. As you commissioned Moses, we pray, O Lord, that every one of us will hear your voice and your voice will lead, direct, and control. Relying upon you, the everlasting one, we pray, O Lord, that we'll never fail in the task ahead of us. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Tonight, I invite you to study with us in Exodus chapter 3. Today, we're studying from verse 1 through to verse 22, pleading and praying unto the Lord that He will open our spiritual eyesight. He will instruct us in the deep things of God. This chapter treats of Moses' call at the burning bush. As we read together, you may discover that this is quite a familiar passage. But then there is so much in this passage that we really need to depend upon the Lord to see us through. Let me remind you that in the previous chapter, Moses attempted to start his ministry of delivering Israel from bondage. His method was not a danger of God, and his timing was not appropriate. We learned that last week. He demonstrated impatience. He walked by sight. He walked in the energy of the flesh. He displayed zeal without knowledge. Dare we point any accusing finger unto Moses? Perhaps the vast majority of us, perhaps the vast majority of Christians everywhere, anywhere, once or twice or more than that, has also demonstrated impatience. You see, impatience is a terrible trait in the character of man. It shows the corruption of the nature of man and it lands us into trouble. And as we act in impatience, we definitely walk by sight. And we walk in the energy of the flesh. And very many times, new converts, and even people who are not supposed to be new converts, who have known the Lord for some time, they display zeal without knowledge. May God help us that in all these things we learn about Moses, that a change, a transformation will come in us as well, so that we'll display mature characteristics in a Christian walk. You see, at that time, God's time had not fully arrived. Israel had not recognized Moses' call to be their deliverer, and Moses himself had not received instruction, training, discipline, and specific leading from God. The impetuosity and impatience of Moses brought him into serious trouble. That is what you'll always find in our lives. It may be that we know that something ought to be done. It may be we feel the call of God within our bosom. But mistaking the call of God for the time of God, many times we rush ahead. It may be in Christian work, Christian ministry, Christian service. Or it may be in wanting to go for missionary assignment. Or it may be in the area of marriage. It may be in wanting to get something done in the household of faith, 
in the house of God, that many times without receiving instruction from the Lord, without appropriate training for the task, and without the discipline of character that makes us sober, that makes us slow. Not that we are rebellious, not that we are dragging our feet away from the assignment, but there are times we need to be slow as we look at the task that we ought to engage in. But because we have not been trained, we are not sober enough, we are not deliberate enough, we are not slow enough, we are not looking well enough, we do not have enough insight and enough a foresight for the work. We've not been disciplined by the mighty hand of God. And we have not received specific leading from the Lord. Impetuosity and impatience may throw us forward, but we land ourselves into serious trouble. Moses knew that he had important work to do for God, but he did not know that he was not yet well equipped. Although the Bible says it was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, the Bible also says the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. He was mighty in words and deeds. That's what the Bible says. But remember, the Bible also says it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Do you see that in our lives we need to balance of scripture? On the one hand, you may be learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. But you realize no colleges in this world can well equip you for divine service. We must still be taught in the school of God. Balance your knowledge of the scriptures. Learned on the one hand in the wisdom of this world. On the other hand, you realize that wisdom is foolishness with God. You still need the wisdom that is from above that is first pure, then peaceable, easily entreated, so that God himself will be able to guide and lead you. Perhaps you think you are mighty in words and in deeds. At the same time, you'll need to remember, it's not by power, it's not by might, it's by the Spirit of God. Well, that is what we learned last week. We have learned of the failure, of the impatience, of the trouble into which Moses found himself. But now, he had settled down in Midian, and God now appeared unto him. Let's open our Bibles together now. We're reading from chapter 3, verse 1. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the Midian, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Can we stop there for a moment? Moses had perhaps now accepted that perhaps the call is gone. The assignment will be transferred to another. His foolishness, he might have thought, had cost him the whole ministry that now he'll never be able to do anything for the Lord. Eventually now, he had resigned himself to what was available to be done. But then he did that consistently. He did that faithfully. He did that with all his strength. Isn't that a good lesson to learn from Moses? That even though now you are not on the missionary field, even though now you are not pastoring a church as a full-time worker and pastor, even though now you are not in full-time service for the Lord, which perhaps is your goal, which perhaps is your calling, which perhaps is your expectation, in whatever you find yourself doing now, do you know how to do it? You do it with all your strength. You do it with all your mind. Because the Lord will be watching for what you are doing at this very time now. Here is what Moses was doing, but he did it well. And whatever you find yourself doing, it may be in your office. It may just be as a homemaker, as a wife. It may be as a mother over your children. It may be as a husband, it may be as, a, as um, a father, or it may be as a part-time worker in the service of the Lord. What I mean is that you still have your employment that you are doing, and then you are employed partially in the work of the Lord. Make sure that you do what you are doing with all your strength. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10, Whatsoever thine hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Don't say well. Since I've not been allowed to go into the missionary field as now, as at now, 
since I've not been called into full-time pastoral work as at now, since I've not been allowed to join the full-time staff in the church as at now, well, I will not take life serious. Moses took life serious. And he did what he ought to do. And it was in the midst of that that the Lord now found him. I want to encourage you. Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. As you come to the New Testament, how do you find the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ? Where did Jesus find them? We're told of Simon Peter. We're told of Andrew. We're told of James. We're told of John. We're told of Matthew. What were they doing? Well, they were busy in the employment they found themselves in. Uh, Peter and Andrew as fishermen. They were in the trade. They were in their work. Consistent. Very serious. And they were devoted to it. And then the Lord called, called them and he said, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Why do you think that you need to be idle? Because you say the Lord is calling you. Why do you think that because you feel the call of God, because you think you are going to be a pastor, because you think you are going to be a missionary, you resign your work. You have nothing doing. You wake up, you eat, and you just roam around. That is not the will of God. So then we find Moses. That Moses, as at this time, was really doing something. And he was serious about it. He was faithful. In that which he found himself. Wherever you are, be faithful. You know something? There are some people that are in the church. And in the church, it may be that all that you have is just maybe leading us fellowship. All you have is perhaps being an usher. All you have is maybe you are in the choir. All you have is that you are a coordinator. All you have is that you are a zona leader. Or you have another thing you are doing. Don't say, well, I'm looking for something greater. Moses was. I'm looking for something higher. Moses expected that. But in that which you are doing now, do it with all your mind. Be faithful there. And it is at that point of faithfulness, not idleness. It's at that time of being zealous in the things you are doing. That God will come to you and give you a call. Now let's go back to Exodus chapter 3 verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burnt with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not consumed. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put up thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Let's stop for a moment here. Let me just describe the situation to you. The situation is this, that Moses was at the backside of the desert. That's in verse 1. Being a desert place, it will be a dry place. Being a dry place, it will be a place that if the bush ever caught fire, the bush will be burnt to the ground. That's the nature of the desert. Not only that, it will burn without being able to be contained. It will spread and spread and spread. That's what we know about bushfire in the wilderness, in a dry land. Now, this Moses saw a strange sight. He called it a strange sight himself, or a great sight in verse 3. What happened is that the bush was burning. That was not the surprising thing. I'm sure that Moses would have seen a burning bush many, many times in the desert. The surprising thing is this. The fire did not consume the bush. Not only that, another thing that was strange is that when he turned to look at what was taking place, a voice spoke from the bush. I want you to now collect all those facts together. This great sight, this strange sight number one, 
The bush was burning. That's not strange. But then it was not consumed. Then he became curious. And he said, I will turn around and see. As he just turned around wanting to see, a voice spoke from that, uh, from that burning bush. The bush was not consumed. How strange. How supernatural. How different. How mysterious. Then a voice spoke. And this was not an ordinary voice. That was strange enough. But the most strange of all is that it called his name twice. Moses, Moses. He recognized that name. He had been given that name by the daughter of Pharaoh. That took him out of the river saying, I'm giving this name because I took him out of the river. Exactly that name by which he had been called by the daughter of Pharaoh. This name was called twice and unconsciously immediately he said here i am but do you say do you see something he didn't say here i am god he didn't know was talking he didn't say here am i my father he didn't know was talking he just said here i am and then god said something in verse 5 he said draw not nigh hither he says i want you to draw near to me but don't draw near out of curiosity you see there are people that try to draw near unto god but it is not out of reverence. It is not out of honor. It is not with trembling. It is with curiosity. And so God warned him and cautioned him. Don't draw near because of curiosity. But draw near because of reverence. It says the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Do you know that anywhere God has his appearance, there may not be a tabernacle there, a cathedral there, a temple there. There may not be a mighty synagogue there. Anywhere God has his presence is holy ground. That is why the moment we start our fellowship in a particular place, and we begin to use that place for prayer and reading the Bible there, singing to the Lord, giving testimony, making our request, and sending message unto heaven, and expecting heaven to send message unto us in that place that has become a sanctified place, an holy place, a place where we cannot just do anything we like. That's why we say, if we're using a place for a house fellowship, make sure that the place is suitable. That there is no object in that place that will be object of sin, object of evil. And that it cannot be a place of prostitution. It cannot be a place of adultery. It cannot be a place of fornication. That city room where we're using for the house fellowship, you might just call it well a city room. Once we bring the presence of God there. Once we bring the worship of God there, once we hear the voice of God there, it turns it to holy ground. Well, you see that uh, district church we have at the back side of the house. Well, you cannot just uh, pour anything there. You cannot just pour urine there. You cannot just pour whatever dirt is in there. You know why? Because the moment you turn that place to a place of worship, a place where we honor God. A place where we are sending messages unto the eternal one. And where we are expecting our prayers to be answered. For heaven to send messages unto us and to send answers to our requests. It becomes a holy ground. And therefore we, we comport ourselves in such a good way. It cannot, when the fellowship is over. And the members of the church, the district church have gone back home. We cannot use that place for sin. We cannot use that place for a sinful, carnal, fleshly, worldly ceremony. Because, you know, it is holy ground. And then God began to speak unto him. And he says, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. What did Moses do when Moses said that? You see, in verse 4, when he answered God, he just said, here I am. He didn't know what's talking. But now when God introduced himself, when God said, here is who I am, and I want to get your attention, I want to speak to you. Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now before we bring real interpretation to uh, this and make the application to our lives, I want to ask a question. Was this story really true? Was it something that actually took place? I want to tell you with all confidence, it actually took place. You say, on what authority can we say it actually took place? Well, let's see Jesus Christ referring to this same incident in Luke chapter 20. Luke 
chapter 20. And reading from verse 37. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush. You hear that? Even Moses showed at the bush when he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now Jesus uh, said something here. And you, re you really need to understand the words of Jesus Christ. Now he says that Moses called God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. You say, is that so? I thought it was God that called himself. I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Yes, that's right. What Jesus is saying is that it was Moses that wrote Exodus chapter 3. He wrote the whole of Exodus. And he wrote Exodus chapter 3. And in the writing of Exodus, in relating and relaying what God said, Moses now said, here is what I heard. And in, and in that place, he now called God by what God called himself. But then Jesus Christ referred to this, and he referred to it as something that took place at the bush. That is, at the burning bush. Let's see another confirmation of this. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, reading from verse 30. And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and at the, as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled, and does not behold that he was afraid to look upon God. And then in verse 33, Then said the Lord unto him, Put up thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt. And I have heard their groanings, and I am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. Well, you see from the account here, there is a lot we need to learn. Let me point this to you. Already I have shown you that the story we are reading in Exodus chapter 3, is confirmed by Jesus Christ and it's also confirmed by Stephen who preached this message in Acts chapter 7. So then we know of the truth and the validity of the story we're studying today. But let me point out something to you here. Look at verse 23 of Acts chapter 7. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren the children of Israel. Now it tells us that when Moses first of all went to the field to visit the children of Israel, at that time he was how old? 40 years old. Now look at verse 30. And when 40 years were expired, there appeared unto him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. Between the time he got into the land of Midian and this time the Lord appeared unto him. How many years again? Forty years. Now look at verse 36. And he brought them out. After that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness. Forty years. How many years did he spend in the wilderness as he led the children of Israel out of Egypt wanting to lead them to the land of Canaan? 40 years. Have you learned something there? The years of the life of Moses are remarkably divided into three forties. The first 40 years is spent in Egypt. The second 40 years is spent as a shepherd in Midian. The third 40 years as the leader of Israel in the wilderness. Now we find him. That's in the passage we have read in Exodus chapter 3. We find him at the backside of the desert leading the flock. Withdrawn from the noise and din of Egypt, from the bustle and confusion of Egypt, 
unaffected by the crash in the, in the monetary and commercial world. At the back of the desert, he had time to meditate, to pray, and to weigh the reality of all things within and around. Well, we might say that uh, Moses having to run to Midian was unfortunate, but it is just characteristic of God that God can turn a negative situation and turn it into something wonderful, something very instructive. I told you last week that when Moses did what he did, he then had to run away from Egypt and get into the land of Midian. And we, and we said he landed himself into trouble. That is true. But you know something? God can take that negative situation in your life and turn it to a school. And turn it to a time of maturity. A time of waiting upon the Lord. You see, as Moses left Egypt, he did something for him. All the noise and the din of Egypt, all the bustle and the confusion of Egypt, all those things did not affect him anymore now. The crash of the monetary system, the commercial world, all that did not affect him anymore now. At this backside of the desert, he had time to do something. There was nobody to disturb him. There were no friends to disturb him. Even the cries and the groanings of the children of Israel, they were not there to disturb him. He wasn't affected by any of these things. Now he could meditate. Now he could pray. Now he could weigh the reality of all things within him and around him. The drive of ambition, that was silent now. He never even knew that he would ever become anything anymore. The world's praise was not there to tempt him. The thirst for gold, unknown. The pride of achievement was not felt. Neither was human applause nor human censor there to elate or to depress. Thus, he was in God's own school. He was educated for the ministry right there. It was there that God taught him patience. God taught him to evaluate himself. God taught him to see his own insufficiency. God taught him to see his own weakness. God taught him to see the necessity of relying upon God. Was he alone like that? No, not at all. As you look at men of God, at the people God called, all through the Bible, you will see characteristic things like this concerning them. You think of Samuel. You think of Elisha. You think of Elijah. You think of a person like Daniel. You think of John the Baptist in the New Testament. You think of Paul the Apostle who said he was in Arabia for some time. And nobody knew what he was doing there except that he had a time to meditate and a time to pray. And a time to weigh all the issues of life. As it was with Moses, these people found themselves in a place where God's voice alone is heard. Where his light alone is enjoyed. Where his thoughts alone are received. Have you found yourself in such a place? Have you found that you need a time of quietness? A time of devotion with the Lord? A time when the things of the world do not tempt you? A time when you can relax and meditate and think about just the reality of the call of God alone? Well, the voice of God alone is what you hear. Where friends are not there to con confuse. Where counselors are not there to confuse. But the thoughts of God are received. Moses spent the second 40 years of his life in a place where every opportunity for communion with God was afforded. So must it be with us if we would succeed in the ministry. As we have read in Exodus chapter 3, Moses saw this great sight. He was he saw the bush burning in the desert without being consumed. He wanted to see and find out why the bush was not consumed. And then God spoke unto him. What do we learn of this burning bush? When it says the bush was burning, let me remind you that God never does anything without purpose. I want to show you and I want to remind you that in those early years of God teaching people the knowledge of his will, the knowledge of his word, he spoke most of the time, much of the time, in pictorial forms. That's the way we teach little children when they first start schooling. We teach them by objects they can see, objects they can handle, objects they can count, objects they can see in a picture, objects they can attempt to draw. And so, in the infant stage, 
of people of the people of god receiving the knowledge of god they learned a lot of things by objects they can see objects they can behold objects they can think about indelible pictures that never left their mind so then this burning bush what does it mean what does it signify let the bible speak and interpret itself in deuteronomy chapter four chapter four Deuteronomy chapter 4, reading from verse 20. But the Lord has taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance, as ye are this day. Do you see the answer in that passage I've read to you? What's a furnace? A furnace is a place where there is fire. What's the iron furnace? An iron furnace is a place where all the sides of the furnace is made of iron. And then they put fire inside. And then it says, you are brought out of the iron furnace. Which means actually the burning bush illustrated and pictured the children of Israel. And remember that uh, Moses saw this at the backside of the desert. When we talk of Egypt, we are talking of a desert place. No rivers, no marshy ground. Only river Nile helped them to channel irrigation into their farms. So then, when it says that he saw the bush burning at the backside of the desert, it was a picture of the children of Israel. One, God was telling the children, uh, God was telling Moses, he said, There is the burning bush. Do you know something about the children of Israel? It is pictured by this the fire is still burning. Do you think that the fire is gone down now since you left Egypt? Since you ran away and you came to Midian, oh no, the bush is still burning. But do you think that they, are, that they are consumed? Do you think that they have now all perished? No, the children of Israel in all that persecution, they are yet not consumed. They are still there, but the fire is burning and I want to deliver them. It is a picture of the children of Israel suffering in the fire of affliction. Let's see the reality of this scene. Here we come to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. We're reading about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know the story, but let's look at it from verse 22. Daniel chapter 3, from verse 22. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot. Do you remember what I told you about the furnace, the iron furnace? A place where fire is made and is burning hot. Uh, burning very hot. The flame of the fire slew the men, those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning furry furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto the counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like unto the Son of God. Now you can see the picture being fulfilled really there. They are like the burning bush, that is the bush that had no comeliness and no beauty. That even Babylon will not reckon with. And he threw them into the iron fairy furnace. Very, very hot. In fact, so hot that it burned the people that threw them in. But then they stood up. Their clothes were not burnt, like the bunny bush not consumed. And they were walking freely. And then there was a presence of God with them. The very Son of God communing with them, fellowshipping with them. Do you remember God speaking out of that burning bush and calling unto Moses and saying, Moses, Moses. And Moses answering, saying, Here I am. Well, that is the picture. Well then, it shows that even though the children of Israel might be suffering in the furnace of affliction, that God was still with them. So that means then that the burning bush was a figure of the nation of Israel. At the time the Lord appeared to Moses, the Hebrews were suffering in the iron furnace of Egypt. But though the flames burned fiercely, they were not consumed. 
the fires of persecution have blazed seriously for many centuries, but Israel has been miraculously sustained. That says much more than just when they were in Egypt. As you look at the history of the children of Israel, do you understand that sometimes there is a single passage in the Word of God that has double reference? Reference to the present situation and reference to the future. Already I've referred to the present situation, that is the present situation at that time, to the children of Israel. That at that present time, when Moses saw the burning bush, that they were in the furnace of fire, in the furnace of affliction, in terrible fierce persecution, but they were not consumed. The more they afflicted them, the more they persecuted them, the more the power of the tyrant made the fire of the furnace to burn uh, fiercely, the more they were growing. They were becoming mightier. They were becoming stronger. They were becoming even more in number the more they increased. But that's not all. As you look at the centuries of the history of the children of Israel, you will see that the fire has burned very hot, very hot. As if the children of Israel would have been consumed, would have been destroyed. But because of the promise of God, because of the covenant of God, because of the promise he made unto Abraham concerning his descendants, these children of Israel had been preserved. So then, God himself had always been with them. In fact, God says in one of the prophets, he said, with all the afflictions of the children of Israel, he was afflicted with them. He was right in the midst of that burning bush. It was from the midst of that burning bush he spoke unto them. He had always been with them. Is that the end? No, not at all. Here, here we must come to what we call eschatology. Eschatology means the study of the last events, of the last days. After the church has been raptured, another time of fierce persecution will come for the children of Israel again. And that burning bush looks far ahead to the time of that great tribulation. When the fire of persecution will burn very hot, and yet the Bible says, in the midst of it all, Israel shall be saved out of it. Can the church have any encouragement from this? Can the church see anything in this, in this burning bush? Oh yes, the church can receive encouragement from the mystery and the miracle of the burning bush. The church, like the humble bush, possessing neither beauty nor comeliness, does not need to fear being consumed in the fire of persecution. In our midst and through the flames, God continues to reveal and manifest himself. That's the joy. If you read church history, you will see how the fire burns. In fact, in church history, literal fire burns. In persecution of those dark ages, they burned some of the leaders of the churches, some of the members of the churches, some of the families. They burned them literally in fire. And there were atheists, there were persecutors, there were emperors that threatened that they were going to burn up all the Christians and no trace of Christianity will remain. What do we find today? We find today that the burning bush was not consumed. We find today that Christianity has come down, even to our nation, to many nations in Africa, many nations in the world, even though the bush burned fiercely, and yet the bush was not consumed. Any other lesson we learn from that? Oh yes, you have a Bible in your hand, raise it up and let me see. Oh yes, I understand, wonderful. Let me tell you something about that Bible. You see, there have been times when some emperors were so angry, with Christianity, they collected all the Bibles they could see and they made fire and they burnt everything. In fact, some of them threatened that in about 50 years, the Bible will become a piece of paper, a, a piece of book that you just find in the museum alone, just to, just to have a copy that people will say once, in a, once uh, at a time. Once upon a time in history, there was a book called the Bible. And these emperors and atheists they threatened that the Bible will no more exist because they were going to burn everything. Well, the very fact that I have a Bible, 
you have a Bible, your husband has a Bible, your wife has a Bible, church go aside Bibles, even those who don't go to church have Bibles, and the Bibles multiply. King James Version, Revised Version, New Standard Version, New English Version, and French, and, and Yoruba, and Igbo, and Aousa, many, many languages, more than 1,200 languages right now. The Bible, the people said they were going to burn up, nobody will see again. The burning bush has not been consumed. You see, that is the essence of the word of God. That even though the people have threatened, thank God, our God is still on the throne. And so then we have learned that in your own personal life too, maybe fire is burning. Maybe you are suffering persecution. Maybe your husband is threatening. Maybe your parents are threatening. Maybe your boss is threatening. And maybe they are saying, I'm going to burn up that thing in your life. You'll never be able to mention the name of Christ anymore. My brother, my sister, take courage. They have always tried that. They have never been able to burn up the bush, even though the fire may burn. But the Lord is going to be with us. Look at the promise of God in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 43. And we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. Isaiah chapter 43 from verse 1. But now, thus says the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O, I o Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burnt, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Why is that? Oh, because the Lord himself has created you for his own glory for himself. In verse 21, these people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. That's why the fire will never consume you. That's why the persecution, the affliction, the threatening of the persecutors and the enemies will never consume you because God himself has called you and he is the one that is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And so then we've learned a great lesson. As Moses turned aside to see this great sight, God called, gave him a gracious call and yet a needful caution. And more, the solemn declaration of his name. Now we go back to Exodus chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 6. And moreover he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. Why will God have to introduce himself? By those three names. Is it, was it not enough to say, I am God? Oh yes, that would have been wonderful and great. But God wanted to show Moses the qualities of his character. He said, I am the God of Abraham. What does that mean? It means, I am the covenant-keeping God. Whenever God referred to himself as the God of Abraham, he's referring to himself as the covenant-keeping God. He made covenant with Abraham, he fulfilled it. Then he said, I am the God of Isaac. What does that mean? It means I am the God with whom all things are possible. Whenever you mention the name of Isaac, you remember that the father was so old, nobody knew they could ever have any child. Sarah was so old, nobody knew that she could ever have any child. The God with whom all things are possible. I am the God of Jacob. What does that mean? It means the God whose mercies and compassion and faithfulness are new every morning. That's what Jacob himself said. I am not worthy of the least of the mercies that have shown unto me. It's telling us of the God of mercy. Concerned over the affliction of Israel, God now promised to deliver them and bring them to the promised land. Look at it from verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of the taskmasters for I know their sorrows and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large and unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come 
unto me. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. We praise the name of the Lord because he is not blind to all our sorrow. All our affliction, how blessed for us in times of distress and stress. To know that there is a mighty God who sees our affliction, who hears our cry, who knows our sorrow, who comes to deliver, comes to bring us out of oppression, and he comes to lead us into a good land. Now comes the call and the response of Moses. That leads us to point two, the call and the response of Moses. After Moses had seen the sight and had heard the voice of God, and God had shown him the concern he had for the children of Israel, God now gave him the call. And here we see the call and we also see the response. In Exodus chapter 3 from verse 10, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I, that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly, I will be with thee, and there shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee, when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt. Ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers have sent me unto you, they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Here God revealed unto Moses his call, his plan. And the assignment that Moses was to carry out. I want you to notice one little word in verse 10. The word now. Come now therefore. You see now the time of God had arrived. Forty years previously, Moses became impatient. And he thought to take matters into his own hands. Only to discover that the time for Israel deliverance was not yet tried. Now the hour for divine intervention had struck. Now the time for God to deal with the haughty oppressor of his people had arrived. Now we must uh, take note of that little word now. You must be sharp spiritually, intelligent spiritually, and you must be sensitive to the voice of God that you will know that now is the time. If you run ahead of God, nothing will work. You might just walk by sight and walk in the energy of the flesh. You might just knock things together and knock things down and raise up a lot of trouble, a lot of doors, but nothing is going to work. Let us make sure that we recognize the time of God. The moment when God's time of intervention has arrived, and then we know that now is the time to do it. Now is the time to move. Now is the time to act. Now is the time to speak. But then, Moses at this time, he was no more self-confident. He was no more proud of his achievement, proud of his education, proud of uh, all his ambition. Now he said, who am I? Who am I? Moses at 80 was not so eager as at 40. God's discipline and schooling had tamed him and sobered him. He saw the difficulties now in himself. He saw it in the people. And he saw the difficulties in the task. He said, I don't think I can do it. I see my weakness. I don't think the people are ready for me. He saw the resistance of the people wanting to have him. And he also saw the difficulty in the task. He said, this is beyond me. This is greater than myself. Before we get into the school of God, we say, oh yes, I can. 
I can win all the world to Christ. I can win all this nation to Christ. Leave me alone. I don't need help. I don't need counseling. I don't need prayer. I don't need any other thing. I have everything I need. Let me arise and do it. And then we fail woefully and miserably. And then God begins to teach us. When God has schooled us and trained us and instructed us and has bent us low, tamed us and sobered us, then he calls us. And then we say, God, do you think I can do anything? Do you think I can move anymore? Now I see the impossibility. I see my own shortcoming. He had tried once and he had failed. But now, for long years, he had been out of touch with the children of Israel. But while all this was true, it was now God that called him to this work. And God never makes mistakes. And so God called him graciously. As God called him graciously, God said he will be with him. And he assured him of ultimate success of his mission. Look at verse 12. He said, certainly I will be with thee. Isn't that all we need? However difficult your task may be, however difficult the missionary assignment may be, however difficult the people you are to lead to the promised land, however difficult it may be, However difficult the affliction of the people you are told to deliver, however difficult or great that affliction may be, this is what we need. Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. You see, this is a sign that God has sent us. What's a sign? Now what he has told us to do is actually done. There are people that say, God has sent me to do this. God has sent me to win this whole city to the Lord, and yes, it's never done. God has sent me to bring deliverance to the people of God and no deliverance ever comes. God has sent me that I'm alone and I can do it all alone. I can win this whole nation to the Lord without the assistance of any other person. And they never are able to do it. This is a sign that the work of God has been committed into our hands and we can really do it. In verse 12 it says, this is a sign, this is a token. When thou hast brought them forth, not if, you bring them out, there is no if, there is no but, there is not a maybe, it is with certainty. When thou hast brought them forth, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And then Moses asked an important question. He wanted to know, what's the name, I will tell the people, the name of the God that has sent me. Then the Lord revealed himself as the great I am that I am. That name contains each tense of the verb to be and might have been translated I was, I am, and I shall always be. I was in the past. I've always been in the past. I am in the present. I shall always continue to be in the future. God is the eternal I am, the great self-existent one. Always the same from everlasting to everlasting. Without beginning, without ending. Always the same, eternally changeless. That's the God we serve. That's the God that called Moses in 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel chapter 12. We look at verse 6. And Samuel said unto the people, It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron, and had brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. That's the confirmation of the call, that it was the Lord that called Moses and Aaron as well. So there should be a confirmation of our call. It should be so definite without any shadow of doubt that the call is coming from God. It wasn't only Moses that confirmed it, Samuel also confirmed it. Other people that see the effect of that call should be able to say, Yes, we know this is of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 11. Isaiah 63 verse 11. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people saying, Where is he that brought them up? Out of the sea was the shepherd of his flock. Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him, that led them by the right hand of Moses? 
with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name. So then you see what God said, certainly I will be with thee, it was fulfilled. Certainly you will bring them out of the land of Egypt, it was fulfilled. And certainly you will worship God upon this mountain, it was fulfilled. Then we look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 7, that great sermon of Stephen before he was stoned. Acts chapter 7, reading there from verse 34 to verse 36. Acts chapter 7, verse 34. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and I am come down to deliver them. Now come. Those are the words again. Now, the time has come. Now, you are now ready. Now, I am ready to send you now. Now come, I will send thee into Egypt, this Moses, whom they refused, saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge. The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out. After that, he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. So then the word of God was fulfilled telling us that even now the word of God will still be fulfilled. You see, when God gives his word, he will back it up. It's the great I am that I am. It's the everlasting almighty God. It's the one that has always existed from generation to generation, everlasting to everlasting. It's always the same. The Bible describes him in these terms of his everlasting quality, of his eternal quality. Look at Psalm 90 and verse 2. Psalm 90 verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth or the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. That is, the God that, that sent Moses. The God that said unto Moses, I am that I am. And it is still that great I am that is with us today. And always remember, whatever the assignment, whatever the responsibility, whatever the ministry, whatever God is calling you to do, however difficult you might think it is, it is a great I am, the everlasting one, the everlasting arms, the power of the Almighty that is going to be with you and has given you the certainty of the accomplished task. Now, before we end, let's go to point three. Divine instructions and revelation to Moses. Divine instructions and revelations to Moses. Let's see from Exodus chapter three. Exodus chapter three. From verse 16. I just read through. It appears a little bit long, but just, just listen. And see the instructions God gave unto Moses. Not only the instruction, the revelations he made to him. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the, to the, and the Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. I want you to realize something here. Whenever God calls us, He doesn't call us from uncertainty to uncertainty. He calls us from a place to another place of certainty. He told Moses, he said, you go to the elders of the children of Israel. And then he mentioned again his name, his characteristics and qualities. The God of Abraham, the covenant-keeping God. The God who is always mindful of his promises. The God of Isaac, the God of all impossibilities. With him all things are possible. And the God of Jacob, his mercies, his compassion, his loving kindness, his faithfulness, they fail not, they endure from morning to morning, they are new every morning. And then he said, I have seen your affliction. Then he said, I will bring you out. No doubt about it, I will bring you out. Where am I taking you to? To the land of Canaan. 
the land of the Ittites, the land of the Amorites, the land of the Perizzites, the land of the Hivites, and the Jebusites, in short, to the land that is flowing with milk and honey. Can you see how definite God was? That's how definite God is. If God is leading you to marriage, it will be definite. And there will be no doubt about it. It's taking you out of this place. It's taking you to the other place. If God is calling you into the ministry, there will be no, well, I don't, I, I'm not sure what it's going to be. I don't know whether I'm going to succeed. I don't know whether people are going to get saved, but I just have the ambition. I just have the desire. I'm going. I'm going. Nobody may get saved. I don't know what will happen, but I'm going. I'm going. No. The call of God is not like that. He, he said he was going to lead the children of Israel into a particular place, a place better than where they were, a land flowing with milk and with honey. In verse 18, And it shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, and thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of, East of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord, God of the Hebrews, as met with us. And now let us go. We beseech thee three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. I want to point something to our attention here. God told Moses, he said, the children of Israel will hearken unto you. They will listen to you. They will believe your word because I am sending you. I'm going to confirm your word. I'm going to back you up. I'm going to support you. Then notice this. He said they will appear before the king of Egypt. And when they talk to the king of Egypt, they will tell the king of Egypt that God has sent us. But which God? You notice something here. He didn't say the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Why? Oh, because the king of Egypt did not know Abraham, or know Isaac. Or even no Jacob. I mean this particular one that was raining upon Egypt at this time. But he knew the Hebrews. And so he said, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. We learn a lesson there. When you deliver the message to the elders of Israel, you speak in the language they can understand. The God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. When you deliver the message to the heathen pagan king, the king of Egypt, the one that doesn't have any idea at all about the Almighty God. You simplify your language. We are Hebrew people. We have a God that we serve. Our God, the God of the Hebrews, has appeared unto us. And it says, now let us go, we beseech you, so we can go and sacrifice to our God. In verse 19. And I'm sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. You see here, God told Moses, he said, it is not the first appearance to make before Pharaoh that you say, okay, that's all right. Now all the children of Israel, all their taskmasters, leave them and release the people. God said, it will not be like that. God never deceives us. He tells us, if we're going to meet difficulties, if there's going to be any resistance, if there's going to be any problem, he told Moses, he said, the man will not allow you to go just the first time you appear there. But then he said, I will stretch out my hand. Never worry about the first appearance of resistance, about the rebellion, about the question he may ask, about the kind of tyrant he may appear to be, because I will stretch out my hand. I will smite Egypt with all my wonders, and I will do that I will do in the sight, in, the, in their midst thereof. And then he says, after that, he will let you go. After that, he will let you go. And then he says in verse 21, And I will give these people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty. God was telling Moses, he said, all the work they had been doing and they had not been paid, on the day they are to leave Egypt, I'll make sure that they get favor with the people. They will not go empty. They are going to pay them back every, everything. But unto every woman shall borrow, but every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her, uh, of, uh, of he that sojourneth, of that which uh, sojourneth in her house. 
jewels of silver, jewels of gold and raiment, and ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters. Ye shall spoil the Egyptians. So we notice here the certainty of the call. And the certainty of the outcome of that call. You see, there was no possibility of the divine purpose failing. You see, from those verses I've read, God said the words of certainty over and over and over again. See what he said. He said, I will bring you up out of that place. No doubt, it's certain. Then it says, they shall hearken unto thy voice. The elders of the people will hearken unto you. Then he said, I will stretch out my hand and smite the land of Egypt. Then he said, after that, he will let you go. He said, I will give these people favor. Then he said, when you go, not if you go, when you go, ye shall not go empty. God expre expressly declared that he will deliver Israel from Egypt and bring them into Canaan. Let God's unfailing promises be the ground of your confidence, your trust, and your faith. Though all the powers of hell and all the powers of evil may be arranged against us. Whatever God has called us to do will be done, will be accomplished precisely as he has appointed. Only let us seek the grace of God that will enable us to place God between us and our difficulties. And we will not see difficulty, but we will see the power of God, the might of God, the assurance of God, and the confidence that we have will be that God said he will, he definitely will. We've learned a lot from this chapter today. You've seen the call of Moses. You've seen his response. You've seen the divine instructions and the revelations God gave him. Above all, you've seen the sight of the burning bush. And I'm sure you've learned that this church, the church of the living God, has come to stay. No fire can burn it out. No persecution can block it out. Nothing that is done to a child of God can destroy that child of God. The purpose of God will be fulfilled in your life. Have you been like a Christian that is like the burning bush, the fire of affliction, the fire of poverty, the fire of problem, the fire of persecution has burned very seriously and sometimes doubt has come into your mind. Will this fire consume me? The Bible says no. Jesus says no. All the hosts of heaven say no. That the fire may burn hotter than that, but the children of God will not be consumed. The fire will only refine you and make you better in the service of the Lord. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. For what he has taught us today. He has taught us a lot. Bring everything point by point before the Lord. Let your confidence in God grow. Let your trust in God increase. See that sight again in your mind's eye. The burning bush that was not consumed. And whatever you go through, and whatever this church may go through, and whatever Christianity may go through in this land, the fire will never burn, will never consume the burning bush.